I sincerely and solemnly promise this is the last you will see of me or hear of me. I know you're fed up by now. So I'll try to make this very brief and to not talk too much. And I couldn't hope for a better introduction than what Nula gave us, not only to make us think about who the people are when thinking about vulnerability. Sorry, I got this. There we go. But also what duties the European Union owes them. And it's very important to go through EU primary law, as we call it, the Charter, to see the often straightforward, clear, and in many cases unequivocal language with which the European Union commits to protecting those uh, with special needs. And to contrast this with the legal framework of the common European asylum system, namely the Asylum Procedures Directive, um, as also briefly touched upon by Nula, and to really see how extremely and freakishly complex that framework can be and what that actually means for the needs of those people in practice. Now, I'll be focusing more on persons with what we would call special procedural needs. That doesn't necessarily distinguish um, a specific subcategory within the class of people we've been talking about. It's more an issue of angle. We're looking at this from the point of view of the procedure, of the decision maker, and of the specific guarantees relating to the processing of the claim that would need to be in place for those people to be actually able to bring forth the claim and support it. The Asylum Procedures Directive starts with a very basic and important premise explaining that those in need of special procedural guarantees on account of elements such as age, sexual orientation, gender identity, illness, exposure to torture or other forms of serious violence need a very simple thing from the EU member states, asylum authorities. They need what the directive calls adequate support. This is what we find in Article 24 and also the recital uh, mentioned earlier, uh, number 29. The difficulty comes after that. What is adequate support in the asylum procedure? And there, the directive leaves a bit of a gap. The recital only makes a non-exhaustive reference to sufficient time in the process to create the necessary condition for people with those needs to support their asylum application. But beyond those words, member states that are required to transpose and to implement this directive in their asylum procedures need to find and to unpack this concept of giving people adequate support without really having much guidance to refer to. And if you look at how this has been transposed in most countries, the lack of such guidance is palpable. With the exception of one, maybe two member states, most countries seem to be referring to the notion of adequate support without really giving decision makers more information on what actually they need to be guaranteeing in, in an actual asylum procedure, in an interview. One notable exception that I think brings very interesting but also very practical um, guidance to this effect is the Dutch context. So there we're not talking about hard law, as we would call it. It's guidance from the Immigration and Naturalization Service in charge of examining asylum application, which uh, was issued in 2015 and gives a few very concrete examples of what an interviewer needs to guarantee if they come across a person that has those needs. It can be very practical things from allowing the person to walk around the interview room if their health so requires, rather than sitting on a chair for hours. It can be breaks during the interview. It can be having a family member present in the interview if that's not uh, expressly guaranteed. More importantly, also to link to Judge Dawson's uh, earlier presentation on credibility, having leniency when the person may give inconsistencies or um, contradiction in their account uh, of the reasons for submitting an application and for fleeing the country of origin. And I think it's things that you and I perhaps think are obvious when dealing with a person that has those needs. But it's absolutely important to make sure that these guidelines uh, are available to decision makers, that they are not only available but binding on the people that need to implement those obligations in practice. Now, we know from EU law, from what EU law can actually tell us, that 
we need this form of adequate support to people in need of guarantees. And this hints that when talking about those people, we need to give them sufficient time in the process. We cannot really envision that a person, uh, for instance, with disabilities or having suffered severe trauma, even torture, would be able to bring forth a fully substantiated claim in an interview three days after appearing. Yet in many countries, these are the procedures that people actually face, often without legal assistance, often without information. Now, where does the problem actually emerge? There is an intrinsic paradox, a contradiction in the EU law uh, framework itself between the need to give such time and to give such support and the power of member states to use very truncated procedures and often in very difficult context. The complexity with which the directive talks about these different procedures, namely accelerated procedures, meaning that a country can take decisions faster, can reduce key guarantees, shorter deadlines to appeal. In some countries, this is three days even for a person to bring uh, forward an appeal. In many cases, as we also heard earlier, there might not be um, automatic suspensive effect or there might not be a possibility to be heard uh, at the appeal stage in some specific cases uh, designed for so-called manifestly unfounded claims. More importantly, if we focus on another version of procedures allowed by the directive, the border procedure, this also happens within a space of confinement that as we've been discussing can also be a factor exacerbating vulnerability in itself. People entering an airport, a land border, and being detained there for the purpose of the procedure. So these are instances that are by no means exceptional. These are running um, procedures operated by many European countries on a systematic basis. And vulnerable people find themselves in those procedures every day. So how does this actually work? Again, as I mentioned, the suitability, uh, even on principle, of those different procedures and the location in which many of those procedures take place is far from uncontroversial. It's a, it's a key question that we need to be raising constantly when talking about special procedural guarantees. But if we look at the way the law is framed and at what member states have had to transpose uh, and to be guided by when looking at the Asylum Procedures Directive, we have not only extreme complexity and inconsistencies, we have uh, a sense that there is a bit of a lack of principle when talking about those distinctions. I'll give a very um, specific example that relates to one group in particular that the EU has specifically legislated on, which is unaccompanied children. As you will probably know, unaccompanied children are subject to a specific provision different from that of people in need of special procedural guarantees. That doesn't negate, of course, the fact that they have those needs as well. But if you look at the key provision in this regard, which is Article 25, Paragraph 6 of the Directive, and funnily enough, one of the last things to be agreed on by co-legislators during those negotiations back in 2013, after a lengthy process, um, the effect of the compromise and the chipping in uh, by different stakeholders to make that provision agreeable to everybody is palpable. The provision says that unaccompanied children should be banned, uh, should be exempt from the use of accelerated and border procedures, given that it's not in their best interest, given their vulnerability and their, their specific needs in the procedure, subject to a number of exceptions. And these exceptions don't seem really to follow a specific logic or a specific principle. It seems to be a bit of a mix between the, the grounds, the reasons for which a member state may apply that procedure. To give you an example, if you're a child and you arrive at the border, so you would, let's say, be subject to the border procedure um, if you arrive at the border in France or at an airport. According to that provision of the directive, you would be exempt from the procedure if you come from a first country of asylum. You wouldn't be exempt if you came from a safe third country. There's no reason why. That's just what the directive says. If you come from a safe country of origin, so your claim might be assessed as manifestly unfounded, you would have to remain in border detention. If you don't come from such a designated country, but you make a claim that is wholly unrelated to protection, 
and raise no issues of protection, you have the right to be exempt from the border procedure and you need to follow the regular procedure. So the complexity of it all has led quite predictably, I think, to a huge fragmentation of standards when it comes to implementation and practice. And we recall again what we talked about this morning with Henrik Nielsen, that the discretion and the room for maneuver left by the uh, asylum key to member states has of course led to divergent standards. But when talking about an issue such as special procedural guarantees, to me this is half of the story. The other half and probably the crucial half is that EU law in itself is so complicated that it, do it doesn't create conducive conditions for true harmonization. The process is just too complicated for member states that need to use it in practice. So when we talk about practice, what do we have as a picture and as a variety of procedures? I think you have a bit of everything across the spectrum. You have countries that exempt all vulnerable groups from, let's say, border procedures. We mentioned Greece at some point relating to the fast track procedure on the Aegean Islands. As soon as a person is deemed to be vulnerable, they're out of that procedure. And we indeed had thousands of people, the majority of people, coming after the EU-Turkey statement, being exempt from that procedure for reasons of vulnerability. To take the other extreme, after March 2017, Hungary exempts no one with the exception of unaccompanied children below the age of 14. So you could be a pregnant woman, a family with young children, you would have to stay detained in the transit zone to actually follow the procedure. There would be no exemption. And between those two extremes, there's just a wide variety of countries sitting a bit in the middle. There's a lot of countries that exempt unaccompanied children from the border procedure because either national law may prohibit their detention, that's the case in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in other countries, it might also happen as a matter of practice. So in Germany, if you are an accompanied child at the airport, you would not be subject to that procedure. You would be allowed on the territory. Other countries like Croatia have this provision in the law, but actually don't really use that procedure in practice. So it, it's a bit of a symbolic gesture at this, at this stage. One country that to me stays very, very interesting only because it has followed strictly the letter of the directive. So in terms of transposition, it has done the most faithful job that it could, uh, is France. So France codifies exactly the wording of the directive when it comes to its border procedures. If you're an unaccompanied child, you're only exempt for the reasons listed in the directive, not for other reasons. And if you're a person in need of special guarantees, only if the French authorities cannot offer you adequate support Again, the interpretation of that is left open to the authorities. Only then would you be exempt from the border procedure. To give an illustration, last year, 900 people applied at the border in France. That's not a huge number for France, but it's still quite significant. The number exempt from the border procedure for reasons of vulnerability was five. And when it comes to the accelerated procedure on the territory, 21,000 people had their claims accelerated for the grounds listed in the directive again. The number of people taken out of the accelerated procedure for reasons of vulnerability was no more than 51. So this goes a long way to show that even applying the directive to the letter means a very, very complicated and difficult process. The most likely outcome of this is that many people with important vulnerabilities and crucial needs fall within the cracks of that system. Because this complexity discourages potentially authorities from um, evaluating those needs thoroughly when they have to do a very rapid procedures. It's just a very, very quick, uh, quick remark. Uh, obviously because the negotiations on the so-called asylum procedures regulation proposal haven't advanced that much. It seems to be the one of the seven files that is progressing the, the slowest given the complexities and the technicalities involved. What's important to bear in mind as far as the Commission proposal is concerned is that despite the body of evidence uh, demonstrating the difficulties of such complexity and the 
severe impact it can have on the ground, both for the asylum system of a member state, but predominantly for the individual asylum seeker, the Commission does not challenge this approach. So the idea contained in the current directive that only some people are exempt from those truncated procedures uh, is now to be found in the proposal for a regulation on asylum procedures. If anything, some of the um, corollary standards that were included in the current directive, again, as a product of very difficult compromise, um, have been deleted. I'm specifically referring to a provision of the current directive in its Article 46, Paragraph 4, relating to uh, automatic suspensive effect. This looked not necessarily at people channeled in accelerated or border procedures per se, but channeled in procedures that were not designated as such, but that could have an effect on re removing automatic suspensive effect when a person appeals. Just to give an example, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you look at the German asylum system in the so-called regular normal asylum procedure, you may have your claim rejected as unfounded. In the same procedure, it is possible to have the claim rejected as manifestly unfounded. This kind of resembles the uh, certified uh, refusal in the, in the UK. This means that the, the examination procedure at first instance is not different, but because the rejection bears that particular qualification, this has an impact on the person's right to remain on the territory while they're challenging that decision. And in order to extend its protection, the Asylum Procedures Directive stated that where this is the case, for those people that need special procedural guarantees, you need to have a few safeguards in place. You need to give them a reasonable time to appeal uh, and other appropriate safeguards. And this little bit is not to be found in the Commission proposal. So in practical terms, some of the guarantees that are now uh, in force would not be if the Commission proposal were adopted as it was tabled. Now, on the Council side, there's not huge movement at the moment. This has been discussed to quite some extent, but there hasn't been a position yet on the, on the proposal. Neither has the Parliament uh, up until now, but there's been more indications uh, of its position through the publication of a draft report and amendments thereto. And there the idea is to go back to a simpler and more principled approach for people with special needs. There, that there should be a clear and unequivocal prohibition on their channeling to those procedures because of those very dangerous effects. We of course have to wait and see how the negotiations will evolve, but at least this is how the Parliament is thinking about it uh, at this stage. I'll leave it at that. I think I've tired you enough, but look forward to any further questions. Thank you.